Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, and certainly greetings to all of you. Thanks for the kind introduction, but especially for the gracious invitation to visit uh, Boston College, an invitation extended to me uh, by President Father Leahy and also the Church in the 21st Century Center. I want to speak to you this afternoon about how the Holy See perceives Catholic higher education in this country. It was a topic that uh, Father Leahy suggested to me. As secretary for the Congregation of Catholic Education, I have the privilege of interacting on a very regular basis, of course with bishops, but also presidents and senior administrators from Catholic institutions of higher learning around the world. And of course, these uh, visits, the accompanying reports that come to our office, allow the congregation to acquire a kind of perspective on the world situation, but also the situation in the United States, both to be, uh, in a sense, comforted uh, by its marvelous strengths, and also perhaps to acknowledge the unique challenges that face the situation in this country. Because the world of higher education, you, because this world is for the universal church a privileged field for her work of evangelization and of her presence in the cultural sphere, the health of America's institutions matters a great deal to the Vatican. Of course, what I say this afternoon is not uh, fully official, but it draws very heavily, as is my responsibility now, draws heavily on the documents of John Paul II and to a more limited extent of Pope Benedict XVI. Before proceeding, I'd like to express my support and admiration for the endeavors to secure the Catholic identity and the ecclesial mission of Boston College, and I'm sure it's also true for those members of other colleges here present, and to encourage your ongoing efforts of becoming a truly great Catholic university. Now more than ever, Catholic colleges and universities in the United States are being called to affirm the specificity of what John Paul called their service to thought as the basis for making a distinct contribution to the church and to society. Despite the founding of the Society of Jesus within a university environment, the first Jesuits, as you know, did not at the outset embrace an apostolate in the world of higher education. Nonetheless, by the time of Ignatius's death 450 years ago, this past July, the society had founded colleges and universities to provide for the promotion of learning and for skill in employing it so as to help make God our creator better known and served from the constitutions. Thus involvement in higher education belongs to the Ignatian charism that is developed in service of the church. As Father Kalvenbach recently pointed out, the society still considers, he said, the intellectual apostolate in line with its mission and of the highest importance. And in his recent address to members of the society to mark the centenaries of Francis Xavier, Peter Faber, and Ignatius, the Holy Father followed suit. He encouraged the Jesuits, quote, to continue this important apostolate, keeping the spirit of your founder unchanged. Indeed, it is only by fidelity to the Ignatian tradition that Boston College will be able to take its place among the best Catholic universities in America and in the world. 
As we turn to the particular question at hand this afternoon, what does the Holy See think are the challenges facing Catholic higher education in the United States? I'd like to make just two preliminary observations. First of all, it's clear that the Vatican's official in interventions on universities, especially those of the popes, are rarely directed to specific nations. They are on a few occasions, and I'll mark those, but they're directed to the universal church, even if often they are made to bishops or academics of a certain country. Therefore, a certain reading between the lines is always necessary. This reading leaves room for interpretation. I will offer one interpretation, but I wouldn't uh, want to say the only one. However, during the ad limina visits of the American bishops to Rome in 2004-2005, an opportunity was provided for them to meet with members of the Congregation for Catholic Education, with the prefect, myself, and certain senior officials, in order to discuss the particular situation of higher education in their local churches. They speak at these meetings honestly and freely. Many other bishops, or many of these bishops, took time also to make individual appointments to discuss matters of more particular concern. So these visits provided our dicastery with a, I think, a pretty good reading of the pulse from the bishop's perspective uh, of the situation of higher education in the United States. I'm going to deal with a few of the, just a few of the challenges. Good Lord, I couldn't deal with all of them. But I'd like to talk about, first of all, the challenge uh, to American institutions to be the leaven of the renewal of the academy in the United States, not just the Catholic Academy. The, the role of the Catholic University vis-a-vis uh, -vis the academy at large. Second, I'd like to, of course, address the question of Catholic uh, identity, not a surprising uh, matter of concern to the Holy See. I'd also like to deal with the question of the fragmentation of knowledge. Uh, John Paul's call for an integral humanism to inspire and infuse the Catholic University. And lastly, an appeal for intellectual, educational solidarity uh, at a global level, responsibilities to the world. The renewal of the academy, the challenge that faces America's universities. The very existence of, as Tim mentioned, the 220 Catholic universities in the United States, more than any other country in the world, number two is India. Uh, this constitutes an enormous resource, of course, for both the local church or local churches in this country, but also for the universal church. The sheer number, 220, and their prestige means that they are well positioned, if they want to do so, to have a significant influence on American higher education in general. The church needs these institutions because they serve her mission of proclaiming the truth and of casting light on cultural values, purifying them, correcting them, raising them. Even a brief glance at history tells us how important religion and faith have been in the formation of culture. To ignore or deny this is not only an error of perspective, it would also be a disservice to the truth. It seems, therefore, that a fundamental role for Catholic universities is to ensure that this role of faith is attended to in the academy and in society at large. The Catholic University 
raises the faith questions. It is precisely the conversation between faith and reason, between the gospel and culture, which the Catholic University must keep alive. And it does this, I think, not just out of a sense of fidelity to its own intellectual tradition, but also as a service to the broader academic community to which it belongs. Not unaware of this country's superpower status, and despite the fact that only 6% of the world's Catholics are American, the Holy See recognizes the unique role of the United States in the globalized world of higher education. When he was prefect of the Congregation for Catholic Education, Cardinal Laghi, when he was at St. Anselm's College a few years ago, said this, and I think it well summarizes the position. The role which the United States plays in the world today, politically, economically, and culturally, invests its universities with immeasurable responsibility and importance. Ideas generated here soon become widespread throughout the world. These universities then, and the Catholic universities by particular vocation, must guarantee that the genuine good of all human beings be served and that nothing issues from the university which would be against the true good of the human person. Kind of stern warning, warning and a call to responsibility. The specific vocation of the Catholic University is then to renew the academy by its unequivocal commitment to the dialogue between faith and culture and the development of a culture rooted in faith. It's a very, and should become a very significant interlocutor in this regard. Catholic universities are in the academy. They are not ivory towers that flee from it. Catholic institutions of higher learning in the United States should be, as John Paul said to a group of American bishops in their last ad limina, they should be at the forefront of the church's dialogue with culture, where the future of the church and of the world is being played out. Catholic identity. Again and again, and this happened predictably also today during my visits here at Boston College, again and again, discussion in academic circles returns to the Catholic identity of America's Catholic colleges and universities. It's interesting that at Vatican II, the Council Fathers did not address this question at all. But it was shortly afterwards, in wake of the upheavals of 1968, that the Holy See identified the need to emphasize the specifically Catholic mission of the Church's institutions of higher learning. Certainly, John Paul II had a keen interest, which he expressed often. He had a keen interest in the distinctively Catholic character of church-related higher education. According to him, quote, one of the greatest contributions our educational facilities and all Catholic institutions, their greatest contribution that they can offer society today is their uncompromising Catholicity. For John Paul, it was imperative that universities recognized by the church be, as he said, genuinely Catholic, Catholic in their self-understanding and Catholic in their identity. When he was in this country at Xavier University in 1987 in New Orleans, I remember being there, he said to a group of leaders, I wasn't a leader, I was a faculty member, he said this, the greatest challenge is and will remain 
that of preserving and strengthening the Catholic character of your colleges and universities, that institutional commitment to the Word of God as proclaimed by the Catholic Church. He said the same in 2004. It is of utmost importance that the Church's institutions be genuinely Catholic, and so on. Pope Benedict, although he has spoken less frequently about Catholic higher education, shares a similar concern for the distinctive identity of ecclesial institutions, not just, however, uh, universities. Healthcare and social agencies have also attracted his attention. Last year, in expressing his admiration for ex corde ecclesiae and for his predecessor's implementation of this, he remarked that John Paul II always showed that the Catholic identity is in no way reductive, but rather exalts the university. I think that bespeaks his own mind, that the Catholicity of the institution exalts it, it adds to it. An institution of higher learning, precisely as Catholic, must have a clear ecclesial identity, which it publicly expresses. To ensure the presence of this identity and to strengthen it are the greatest challenges facing Catholic higher education in the United States. The primary concern of the Holy See is therefore encouraging and, where necessary, fostering and the reclaiming of an institution's vigorous and transparent Catholicity. The Vatican's goal is to help make a university's choice of being Catholic an ever more intentional one, and one which would have consequences in strategic planning. A university which acknowledges its Catholicity by its willingness to be bound by the norms of ex corde ecclesiae is an institution of the church. Catholic universities are institutions of the church. The purpose of the university is to ensure, in a publicly recognized way, an authentically Christian presence in the world of higher education. The phrase that you know from ex corde ecclesiae, such an institution should manifest a Christian inspiration, not only of individuals, but of the university community as such. A Catholic institution of higher learning is indeed more than a collection of individuals, even if they are animated by faith, who strive to promote the common good through teaching, research, and service. No. Most Catholic scholars do this in outside of Catholic universities. In a Catholic university, the witness expected is institutional. It's not just a group of like-minded people with a civil charter to engage in, a, in the pursuit of uh, education, uh, to find a competitive niche and fulfill it. It's precisely as institutions that Catholic universities enjoy a specific ethos. They have a conscience. They have a way of being that stands for something that is above the, uh, any particular individual in it. An individual can betray it. Therefore, their institutional commitment must be a fundamental principle involving the whole being of the university. It is not something that is shoved off to a certain branch, a certain school, a certain set of departments, a certain VP. Catholic colleges and universities are structured expressions of the church, of the church's mission. Of course, they maintain the autonomy that is proper to them precisely as a university, an, aut an autonomy that the Holy See has really, frankly, protected from the beginning of universities against the encroachment often of local authorities. They have this autonomy, 
but they are connected with and in harmony with the evangelizing mission of the church. It's part of the, they're part of the communio. They're sort of the academic wing of the koinonia. For the ecclesial community, universities are a privileged place for the evangelization, uh, for evangelization in the world of culture. They accept the rights and the responsibilities of having a visible relationship to the church, which is represented by the local bishop, uh, by the sponsoring religious community where that's applicable, and to the Holy See. The service of truth, another great challenge. From the Vatican's viewpoint, Catholic higher education in the United States, if it is to secure and strengthen its identity, and from this make a contribution to the church and society, it must engage in a continuing reflection in light of the Catholic faith upon the growing treasury of human knowledge. When they are true to the mission expected of them, Catholic universities propose a particular vision. They have a vision. And this vision animates their intellectual life. This vision is all-embracing, not in the sense of being uh, totalitarian, but in the sense of being Catholic. It's an embracing uh, vision because it entails a distinctively Catholic way of apprehending reality, a way which is ultimately grounded in the truth and in the freedom that flows from the truth. A Catholic university then lives from, it breathes, and it also seeks to transmit a Weltanschauung, a worldview grounded in a great tradition. This means, of course, more than the presentation of the Catholic intellectual tradition in the university's curriculum or of lip service to it in uh, faculty scholarly activities. A Catholic vision can be relished, should be, deepened, communicated. And it does this by giving it more than equal time in a cafeteria of ideas. It's an informing vision. The other, after all, one would expect from any uh, university which looks at a wide spectrum of ideas in the, in the liberal tradition. For its part, a Catholic university is the responsible bearer of a vision and a tradition which can enrich the wider academic and social community. Even while open to the light of faith, the contemporary Catholic university is being challenged from another quarter. And this is, from what John Paul said, from the widespread conviction that the possibility of attaining truth is an illusion. It's not surprising then that papal interventions sort of in the, in the area of higher education repeatedly affirm that the foundation of the Catholic University's intellectual life is a precise conviction about truth. And one must admit, it's not a conviction that is, in fact, widely shared in the, in the academy. Ex Cordia Ecclesiae states it very well. It is the honor and the responsibility of a Catholic university to consecrate itself without reserve to the cause of truth. A Catholic university is distinguished by its free search for the whole truth about nature, the human person, and God. For its part, therefore, the Catholic university fosters the conviction that truth can be pursued and to a limited but nonetheless real extent it can be attained by the human mind and communicated to others. Speaking to a group of American bishops on their ad limina visit, 
Pope John Paul II expressed the hope that the search for truth would be a primary concern of America's Catholic universities. And he said this explicitly. The greatest challenge to Catholic education in the United States today and the greatest contribution that authentically Catholic education can make to American culture is to restore to that culture, ours, the conviction that human beings can grasp the truth of things and that in grasping the truth that they can know their duties to God, to themselves, and to their neighbor. The contemporary world urgently needs the service of educational institutions which uphold and teach that truth is that fundamental value without which freedom, justice, and human dignity are extinguished. This quote from Veritatis Splendor. Truth, truth then is searched for, but it's also received and to be handed on. The Catholic University is open to all branches of truth. And a culture without truth cannot safeguard, ultimately, freedom, puts it at risk, and is in danger, of course, of becoming totalitarian and simply subject to the will of a particular majority at a particular time. A third concern, the integration of knowledge. A third serious concern of the Holy See in looking over sort of the American landscape is the fragmentation of knowledge. You know, this is a, a different kind of level of question, but it's the fragmentation of knowledge with its high level of compartmentalized information and little capacity for synthesis. Indeed, in Fides et Ratio, John Paul said, this fragmentation leads many to wonder whether it is still, whether it still makes sense to even ask the question of meaning. Many institutions have shelved it. It is all too possible that con the contemporary university, Catholic or otherwise, will be reduced to a complex grouping of academic disciplines that produce, what, unrelated factual results. If this is only the case, then the Catholic University's mission is seriously compromised. The Holy See invites our colleges and universities to meet this challenge of fragmentation. I'd like to quote Father Kaufenbach. He, he affirmed, it is necessary for Catholic colleges and universities, quote, not to lose sight of the raison d'etre of the university as a center for integrating knowledge. He continued, a center which proposes the search not for the narrow truth, but for the whole truth of which Newman spoke, with an accurate vision and comprehension of all things. So Father Kalvenbach. Note that the problem here is not specialization. It's not the specialization of knowledge or the legitimate methodological autonomy proper to the various disciplines, which in fact are even increasing in number. It's the fragmentation of knowledge. As an antidote, every Catholic university should take up anew its task of fostering a synthesis of knowledge while demanding this task is certainly not impossible. And in one of his few talks to the academic community, the Holy Father last year speaking to uh, Sacred Heart University, um, Italy's Catholic University, he said this. He recalled the basic premise that unifies Catholic intellectual life. It's so simple, but it's also too often forgotten. He said this. What unifies Catholic intellectual life is this, the divine logos, 
eternal reason is the origin of the universe and was united once and for all with humanity, the world, and history in Christ. This horizon of meaning provides the foundation for the intrinsic unity that links all branches of knowledge, the eternal logos. To keep their original genius intact, Catholic universities in a globalized world must refrain from putting into place simply organizational structures and curricula that favor fragmentation of knowledge, a fragmentation into um, sort of uh, commodifiable uh, bits. They cannot abandon the pursuit of wisdom. Universities linked to the church remind the rest of the academy and indeed society as a whole of the thrilling possibility of a higher synthesis of knowledge in which alone lies the possibility of satisfying that thirst for truth which is inscribed profoundly in the depths of the human person. A Catholic university can work towards this synthesis more fully and more freely when you think of it than can a secular one. I think a large part of this is the presence in the Catholic University of philosophers and theologians, a sine qua non, something we take for granted uh, in this country, uh, much to its credit, in every Catholic institution of higher learning. Theologians in particular can help scholars in other disciplines to consider the effects of their discoveries on individuals and societies since theology brings a perspective and an orientation which is often not contained uh, within their own methodologies. This is uh, a value uh, plus. Cooperation and dialogue among scholars is a mark of an academic community's genuine Catholicity, one open to the role of the philosopher and the theologian. The challenge that is presented by the market and the response of integral humanism or Christian humanism. In recent years, the popes, especially John Paul II, judged rather harshly the increasingly popular view which considers higher education as a market commodity. While, of course, the Holy See avoids singling out the United States for special attention in this regard, we can agree, at least I'll propose that we agree, that the commercialization of the, of the academy is well advanced in the United States in general. I'm not thinking of the colleges here. Pope John Paul II deplored the fact that in universities, quote, that in universities, the humanistic character of culture sometimes seems relegated to the periphery. While there is an increased tendency to reduce the horizon of knowledge to what can be measured and to ignore any question touching on the ultimate meaning of reality. To meet this challenge, he proposed that Catholic universities uh, and scholars should dedicate themselves to creating a new, authentic, and integral humanism. This was from his address during, to, to uh, professors uh, during the jubilee, uh, jubilee year. They should dedicate themselves to creating a new, authentic, and integral humanism. The Pope explained that in the present cultural context, Christian humanism perennial in its substance, but always new in its approach and in its presentation, offers an effective answer to the thirst for values and for a truly human life, which burns in the soul of every person concerned about his or her destiny. Catholic institutions of higher education in the United States are, I believe, among the primary instruments 
which can assist the church in her mission to bear witness to an authentic integral humanism grounded in the truth and guided by the light of the gospel. John Paul's proposal for a new humanism is based, of course, on the Second Vatican Council's anthropological vision from Gaudium et Spes, that the human person uh, is only fully revealed uh, in light of the mystery of the Incarnation. That's the, the, the anthropological basis. And he proposes that this Christian humanism, um, uh, based on this, uh, on this value, uh, on this anthropology, and uh, this same anthropological concern was, uh, I think, well summed up by Benedict, Pope Benedict, when he commented that the contemporary understanding of rationality, reducing rationality only to empirical proof by experimentation, he said that this, what does this do? It leaves aside the fundamental human questions how to live and how to die, that these appear to be excluded from a discussion that is based on reason and are merely relegated to the sphere of subjectivity. Consequently, he said, the issue that brought universities into being, the question of the true and the good, in the end disappears and is replaced by the question of feasibility. What is most harmful then about the commercialization of the academy is the underlying assumption about the human person as primarily a consumer and a producer of goods and services. It's bankrupt in its anthropology. Catholic universities can sort of Bring, uh, help bring the academy out of this bankruptcy. According to the Holy See, Catholic universities and Catholic institutions in general can make an enormous contribution to challenging this reductionist vision by reaffirming, reaffirming their tradition of integral or Christian humanism. What does this mean? Again, John Paul II. The humanism which we desire advocates a vision of society centered on the human person and on his or her inalienable rights, on the values of justice and peace, on a correct relationship between individuals, society and the state, on the logic of solidarity and subsidiarity. It is a humanism capable of giving a soul to economic progress itself so that it may be directed to the promotion of each individual and of the whole person. One of the practical applications, I imagine, of a Christian, of trying to implement a Christian humanism is to look at the curriculum and to see how the curriculum or whether the curriculum reflects a genuine integral humanism or whether it has not perhaps fallen prey to uh, an anthropology uh, which is uh, probably at its root uh, corrupt, and if not, if not corrupt, at least uh, severely compromises the rich meaning of the human person. My last point this afternoon is to repeat unabashedly the Holy See's exhortation that American Catholic universities strengthen, or perhaps in some cases, establish a culture of universal educational solidarity. An inter international dimension has been integral to the tradition of higher education since the founding of Europe's first universities 900 years ago. Even then, as they do today, students went, ab went abroad to, to study and uh, scholars traveled widely to pursue their interests. The system functioned in a common language, Latin. Beginning in the 15th century, in the age of colonization, 
the internationalization of education um, proceeded apace. Religious communities were particularly um, influential in this regard, so that higher education throughout the world bears the imprint everywhere of the medieval European university and uh, its later embodiment in the German research university. There is, when you think of a, a remarkable um, kind of common world of, uh, in the world of higher education. There is uh, the basis for, um, uh, for solidarity. There is a basis for it. But Americans are or have been uh, academic isolationists for the most part. This is not true, thanks be to God, particularly in Catholic universities that have been sponsored by, founded by, and continue to be uh, staffed or helped by uh, international religious communities. That's very good news. That would be the case, for example, of the Jesuit universities uh, in the United States, uh, which operate within a, uh, an international system which, by definition, is Catholic uh, and university. But I wonder whether enough has been done. How can Catholic colleges and universities in the United States practically foster not just academic internationalization, which is pretty well taken care of itself, but a culture of global educational solidarity? Certainly, the situation is complex. Globalization enables faculty and students to work and study anywhere and through technology links them uh, rather readily. But the communications revolution has not done away with inequalities. It's created new inequalities, serious inequalities. The globalization means that many countries, or uh, not many countries, many institutions of higher education, particularly in developing countries, remain consumers only of the new technology, that there is a widening gap, again, between the haves and the have-nots in the academic institutions. There is, even among um, tertiary institutions, a new version of colonialism. Now, let's talk about the Catholic University, with its vision founded, ultimately, on the gospel. And we can take the example of a parable, the parable used by Benedict in Deus Caritas Est, all well known to all of us, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Let's apply it to the Catholic Academy in the United States. The parable leaves no doubt, writes the Holy Father, that anyone who needs me and whom I can help is my neighbor. The concept of neighbor is now universalized, yet it remains concrete. Concern for our neighbor, and here Boston College or any other university, might think specifically of its academic neighbors. Concern for our neighbor transcends the confines of national communities and has increasingly broadened its horizons to the whole world. Certainly the Holy Father refrains from drawing any practical um, implications for the world of higher education. He leaves that to you. But who is your neighbor university? How do educational institutions at the service of the church and committed to the gospel, how do they give life to being good academic Samaritans? What can American Catholic universities do specifically your university, what can it do to mitigate the chronic discrepancies in the quality of higher education that mar the life of the church, the one church? For the Holy See, and I know for the Holy Father, this unevenness of the resources available to church-sponsored institution worldwide remains a matter of the gravest concern, and it touches, in a most particular way, the continent 
of Africa. In a joint statement issued by the Congregation for Catholic, Higher, uh, for Catholic Education and for the international, by the International Federation of Catholic Universities, the Holy See called for an increased sharing of the Church's educational resources. A sharing by institutions of the first world with those of developing region, regions, they, they wrote. In the light of the mission of the university to serve, this educational divide can be an opportunity and an avenue where this mandate for service, which everyone claims, where this mandate for service can be realized. The global educational gap, evident sometimes, sometimes even among universities sponsored by the same religious institution, it can be overcome by heightened cooperative efforts. The tools, however, are in your hands. In the United States, there is enormous pressure for universities to be considered first-class institutions. They're ranked according to criteria, which unfortunately allot no points for initiatives on behalf of justice. And I applaud the Catholic universities that take steps and are taking steps, Boston College in, in many areas, with programs that don't gain them points, but fulfill the mission. I think this can be also enlarged to think of educational solidarity with um, other nations. In truth, church-related colleges and universities are the key to future human, economic, and cultural development. No easy solutions are available. I think the question should be raised for an effective solidarity, an, a an exchange of academic gifts and resources between wealthy and successful institutions, such as those, every one in the United States, and those in countries still on the road to development. By way of conclusion, I'd like once again, of course, to express my thanks for all that American Catholic universities are doing to foster the church's mission, especially through bringing to bear the liberating truth of the gospel on contemporary culture. While Catholics around the world owe you a debt of gratitude, they also expect a great deal from the integrity of your witness. Higher education would be impoverished, not just in the church, but in the entire academy in the United States if the opportunities placed in your hands were squandered or lost. The church wants you. It needs you to be distinctively, creatively, and joyfully Catholic. And certainly the Holy See applauds the many innovative efforts being made to deepen and manifest your service to culture, to society, and the ecclesial community. Thank you all very much.